Let's see where it starts. How does that look? Um, you good to go? Yeah. All right. Uh, last night uh, at about 1.30, it became obvious that this is really a 45 minute talk. I'm not going to try to cram 45 minutes of materials into 20 minutes. Uh, uh, you know much is coming in here. You didn't sign up for listening to a 45 minute talk. But uh, suffice it to say that uh, there's a lot to say about library uh, data as linked data in particular. And it's a fun topic. I think we've waved at it a number of times in the last day and a half. And I'd really like to talk about it more with whoever might want to talk about it. Um, so, well, let's just get started. Uh, my talk is called Why Wasn't I Consulted? Linked library data is a customer service medium, and it's a takeoff on why wasn't I consulted. An excellent essay written by somebody named Paul Ford. I'm not sure who he is. Uh, if you Google WWIC, you will find it really easily. I highly encourage you to take a look at it. If you have anything to do with putting things on the web, there's nodding. So uh, some of you have seen this. Good. How many of you have seen or read this, and you know what I'm talking about already? Oh, OK, good. Uh, well. I'm going to oversimplify it and say that the web is for sharing opinions. That's an uh, oversimple way of stating this thesis. Um, how many of you are familiar with linked data, particularly library linked data? Oh, more hands, but still a lot of hands are down. Okay, I'm going to oversimplify linked library data as saying the web is for sharing data. This is my premise. I'm going to put the two together and see if we can untangle this mess in 18 minutes or less. Uh, so let's start with the first one, why wasn't I consulted? Um, Paul Ford's essay is a real masterpiece of thinking about what the web is good for. And in it, I'm, I'm really cribbing his ideas here. I encourage you to, to read it for yourself. It's eloquent and very thoughtful and very astute. Um, he says that when the web showed up, when the internet and the web showed up, people in radio looked at it and thought, oh, this is a radio. People in TV looked at it and thought, oh, this is a TV. People in newspapers thought, this is a newspaper, et cetera, et cetera. Some people even thought it might be an encyclopedia. And some people seem to still think it can replace librarians. Well, his argument is that it really isn't one of these things. I, actually, I added the librarian part. Um, librarian hasn't replaced me yet. Anyway, his argument is the web's ideal service to humanity is, is a tremendously potent tool for sharing opinions and expertise. And by way of elucidating that, he points to a number of very popular websites. We think of them as websites. These things are not newspapers. They're not TV. They're not books. Wikipedia is a way to share opinions and expertise about the things you would find in encyclopedia. It isn't really an encyclopedia. It's just like an encyclopedia. What makes it great is the fact that it focuses on helping people share their expertise. GitHub <coughs> is the same thing for code. It's a social environment for people to fork each other's code and share their opinions about how to make each other's code better. You can say the same thing about Stack Overflow and Quora, which are question and answer services, and Metafilter, uh, which I think a, a large number of people in the library community uh, know quite well. It's, as he points out, not only is it a thoughtful platform for opinions and expertise, but it's, it's got its own meta platform, uh, Ask Meta Filter, on top of a platform for sharing opinions and expertise. Something happens to all of us. Um, so he goes on to enumerate a number of other Sites like this, each of which is really notable for the amount of engineering effort and social foresight and responsiveness that they funnel into improving their tools and services as platforms for sharing opinions and expertise. I think he's right. And he summarizes his argument by saying, anytime he's looking at, he's consulting, or he's working on any kind of website, the first thing he now asks himself is, how can people use this service to share their opinions and expertise about my stuff? If you don't have an answer to that, you haven't found your main objective yet. 
that is a less of an oversimplification of why wasn't I consulted. The URL's at the bottom. Uh, if you can't read it, I just really encourage you to look for WWIC. Uh, it's very easy to find. Uh, so, a little bit more on linked library data. I, ha I literally have about 150 slides on this. Uh, if we're really bored later, we all have a little too much to drink at lunch. Maybe if you're really interested, we could get into some of that. I'm going to try and simplify it with a few slides here. Uh, point number one, uh, and this is about linked data. This is an argument that there are four tenets of sharing data on the web. I said before that, in an oversimplified way, that linked data and library data is a, is a case of that, is, uh, is an argument that the web is for sharing data. Tim Berners-Lee, who knows a few things about building interwebs, uh, says that the four principles of linked data, putting data on the web, are these. Use URIs, we can think of them usually as URLs, as names for things, ideas, data sets, concepts. Uh, when you use these, when you create use these URIs, make them HTTP URIs that people can actually go to, visit, and receive useful information in response. And among that useful information, include links to other URIs that are related and also interesting. It really sounds simple, but it was a real change in my own view of how the web works and how to put things on the web. And I have this, um, this, this, this part, this one screen alone summarizes like 50 slides. So I'm going to take a moment and talk about it um, from one of the other talks. This is an example of the kind of stuff we used to build. Uh, these are screenshots from a, a library that's south of the border. Uh, I think these resources are essentially both well over 10 years old, and I don't think anybody who worked on them would be upset for me to point at them. I didn't work on them, and at the time, they were exemplary. So we have really have two things going on here. At the top left, you have a prototypical library collection on the web. It's a tremendous collection of jazz photographs. It's phenomenal. Uh, if you like jazz like I do, if you like photography like I do, it's, 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 it's a place to get lost on the web. And I don't know if you probably can't really see the arrows, but at the top left, there's like a home page, a landing page. We used to think about home pages as really important, right? Remember that? Uh, well, so if you go to this home page, you can follow a link to uh, a names index, a name of all the people uh, in the photographs that are subject of the photographs in the collection. You can follow that to an actual, from a browse list to an actually line by line list of all the names, and you can click on a particular name. I clicked on Billy Strayhorn, uh, the great composer. And uh, of course, the name isn't Billy Strayhorn, it's Strayhorn, comma, Billy. There's a reason for that. That's the authorized name for him, the authority record. We'll get back to that in a second. But if you follow that down over to sort of the, the middle left where the two screens, the four screens cross, the four corners of Billy Strayhorn, uh, you'll see that there are three images in the collection about Strayhorn, comma, Billy. And you can click on the view of them as thumbnails, follow one of them down to a particular item, get item level metadata that's got things like the name form, straight form, kind of Billy again, and link to the, to the actual image itself. Here comes the food. I'm going to try and keep going quickly. <laughs> Stay with me if you can. I promise I'll end soon. Now, what's weird about all this in my mind is I've added arrows that don't really exist between these two services. The service at the right is an authority catalog. It's a name authority file. And I'm starting with a search result for a straight horn comma Billy. I know it's hard. I'll do a little dance, but I'm uh, If you follow this link to items, there's three items here in the catalog uh, that are related to straight horn comma Billy. You can get to the full authority record. The only thing linking these two things, the actual authority record, these items on a website produced by the same organization that does both of these things is the name string straight word comma Billy. This is the way we've run card catalogs for a century or more. Uh, that's all well and good. But uh, we can do more now. And those principles of linked data come into play immediately here. Um, 
At the right is an image from another collection that's a little more modern than the one I just showed. It's the Art Institute of Chicago. It's about Rembrandt, the, the Dutch painter. Uh, at left is an authority record from our friends at OCLC. It's the same thing. Not unlike what I just showed you on the last screen. It's another version with pretty much the same authority data. But uh, my colleague uh, and good friend Ed Summers uh, had a really good idea about this. He was poking around Wikipedia and noticing uh, after hearing that you can get dumps of things of various shapes and sizes from Wikipedia that they have uh, data dumps of all the external links from Wikipedia articles. So he built a service called Linkypedia. I encourage you to take a look at it. I tweeted the link before I got started. It's pretty easy to find. Uh, Linkypedia mines the data in the external links and from Wikipedia articles and finds links out to particular organizations by their websites. So he put in here, you can put in WorldCat and American Memory and Australia Trail and the London Gazette and find that there are tens of thousands of links out from Wikipedia articles to these resources. It's a great way to see who's linking to your stuff from Wikipedia. <coughs> it's really hard to monitor any other way. So uh, I like the idea that you could find out that there's links to Rembrandt sites like the one at the Art Institute in Wikipedia. But I wanted to take this a step further and promote the idea of Rembrandt as a concept in Linkypedia itself, much like it's a concept in Winky Winkypedia. <laughs> I didn't make it to that far last night. Maybe I, I'm feeling regret. Something about a judge? Anyway, something that's worth talking about. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so Rembrandt now has a cool, clean URI in Linkypedia. The idea of Rembrandt, and you can see all the places linked to from Wikipedia about Rembrandt. Uh, that's kind of fun. It's the same data that's in Wikipedia. It, this isn't really a technical breakthrough, but we've taken the concept of Rembrandt and promoted it. Similarly, Ed had already promoted the concept of these organizations, these institutions, museums, libraries, so forth. And they have their own URLs in Wikipedia as well. So you've got a, a, a URI for something. When people visit it, they get useful information. It links out to other stuff. So you can really start following your nose through all this kind of information. At the middle, we have the thing we had before. At the bottom left, there's another museum site. Uh, at the back here, there's another, I think this is a, a third museum site. We've got the authority record here. We've got the Rembrandt page from Wikipedia. And uh, I thought I should throw in some additional stuff just for fun. I was going to give a talk in Japan. So I pulled out the VIOC record, the Virtual International Authority File record. Um, actually, maybe I didn't. I can't remember the order right here. There's a lot of these different name forms. You've got Pablo, Picasso, and Hebrew, and Japanese over there on the left. Um, and among other languages. Uh, I might have gotten that from the OCLC record. I can't remember which one it came from. Anyway, I pulled that data in and parsed it and generated these links. In, uh, it must have been VIOC. Anyway, VIOC, you can tell that the French form of a name is, uh, well, Pablo Picasso, Picasso comma Pablo. But I can make the link to the BNF catalog search, the one that uses the French. And I could make the link to the National Diet Library of Japan, the one that uses the Japanese name for it, and so on. And you can go out and find even more stuff. Uh, here's, uh, here's Al Pablo Picasso, which is Hebrew. And in the middle, it's uh, uh, Picasso uh, Cubism no Jidai, which is the Cubism era uh, in Japanese. I only know a little bit about both of these languages, but I can read that much, so I'm sorry I'm showing off. But it's, 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 it's a way to follow your nose, and it's a way to follow your nose to cool stuff even further than before. Uh, as an aside, um, we have this sort of problem at this large library that I work at in my day job where people come in and ask questions like, give me everything you have about Ansel Adams. How are you supposed to answer that, answer that in a big library? Well, are you in the prints and photographs division? Well, OK, we can show you some pictures. Uh, I don't know. You know got manuscript materials, you've got letters written to or from that person, you need to go down there. 
is, is any of that all, is it all gonna come together in the catalog if you go to an online exhibit? How are you gonna find this stuff? How do we tie this stuff together? I think it's, it's certainly a problem in big libraries. Uh, I've uh, had the fortunate and misfortune of working in big libraries most of my career, and you, you run into problems like that. I know that we don't all share the same problems. But I think a platform for following your nose through all the different things we have online is powerful. And it's lovely, but I think we're missing something here. We're missing the big picture. Uh, if you ask yourself, uh, how can people use this platform to share opinions and expertise, there's no answer here. Right? We're not there yet. And if you believe what Paul Ford says, we're falling short at this point. We haven't done enough. We need to figure out ways to bring feedback mechanisms into linked data. So I mentioned some other sites that Paul Ford had pointed out. Uh, commenting mechanisms, voting mechanisms, Q&A systems, editing systems. I thought I would play with that a little bit. Um, so I took uh, a, a vocabulary, uh, a standardized vocabulary, which is one of the types of re information resources Online is linked data, and I thought I would try to put it online using a version, a version control system, a software version control system. Uh, I used to work at a medical library, so I know Mesh a bit. So I thought I would play with that. Um, Mesh is the medical subject headings from the National Library of Medicine. They put out annual updates to it. Um, it generally grows; it doesn't usually shrink. Every once in a while, they lump and split terms as, as knowledge changes, and uh, they have a, a nice site where you can go download it in MARC format for the last three years. So I started with those records. They also do updates over the course of the year. When something like SARS breaks in the middle of the year, they add it to an to, to manage indexing the literature that comes out in real time. Uh, so this is a, a browser that NLM provides for the MeSH data. It's pretty old school web, but it's really useful. It shows you all the information you need to know about a concept in MeSH. Uh, it is indicative of the way we used to build websites, though, in that it's static, it uses opaque URIs, it itself is up to date, which is good, but it doesn't show you history aside from what's in the record itself, and it's read only. There's no feedback mechanism. There are no cool URIs to use as part of your platform for following your nose around the web. So I, I wanted to try to see if I can improve on this using, using linked data principles and version control. So I found this great plugin for Django. I, I can do about five minutes on the tech behind all this stuff, but I'll leave it out for now. Um, I found a great plugin that allows you to expose a Mercurial, which is a, version, a distributed version control system, uh, through the Django UI. You basically point it at uh, a version control repository, a source code checkout, essentially on your hard drive, and allows you to uh, sort of visit that data and its history using really nice, clean URIs. So in this case, I loaded, I, ex I exposed the mesh mark records as JSON, so they'd be serialized into individual files because version control, control systems operate best on line-oriented text. And then I, I, lo I loaded 2009, tagged it, then loaded 2010 over it, tagged it and all its changes, loaded uh, 2011 over that, tagged it and all its changes. And what you're left with is something people can visit as link data. You can put a, a, a UI in front of it just like NLM did, but you can also clone it which is a, kind of a cool thing. You can see its history. You can see differences from one year to the next between one tag version and, and the other. Um, in this case, the, the diff isn't that interesting. They just show that they updated the last updated date. So my example of mesh turned out to not be a really strong one, partly because NLM has its act together with managing the vocabulary so well. But I think it might be more valuable in other kinds of data, div data, that sort of thing. And other vocabularies that are not managed exactly uh, with, with the same kind of uh, precision and reliability that NLM does. They're exceptional in how they manage it. So you can look at individual change sets and see comments. It's dynamic in that it's a website that you can integrate more stuff with. It's got an up-to-date view of what's live now, but you can also roll back to the history of an individual item. You can add in uh, core, cool URI mapping services around it. And it's read-write in that you can check out a copy, but you can also get a full version control clone of the history, use that locally, fork it, and make your own changes locally, add things to it if you need to. You can 
edit locally, you can push changes and merges to and from a service that is providing data like this and do all that kind of fun stuff we do now with our source code, but with the linked vocabulary online, in theory. Not very clear. I haven't been doing this with a whole pool of people, but I think it's, 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 it's a lot of potential. It's not all roses, like I said, the diffs themselves are not that interesting in this case. I think we could come up with better examples now that I've done that. You have to think about file names with vocabulary. Do you use this identifier? Do you use that identifier? There are a lot of files in each directory. I actually had to go up to the cloud to process this stuff because on my creaky old uh, MacBook Air, uh, it was going really slowly. Um, and then you have to think about how you're going to serialize vocabularies. We've already got mark records. They're binary. What do you want to do? How do you express it? But there are a lot of possibilities. I think my experiment yesterday proved to me at least that there are real possibilities here. Anybody, you could add a commenting mechanism. It's a Django framework. There's a pluggable commenting system in Django. Or any other web framework that you might use instead of Django. Uh, people could just leave comments on a concept in a vocabulary. Um, people can clone it for local use. And uh, people could fork and submit patches. Uh, as a software developer, this is exciting to me. Uh, but, and there's the important question. Who would actually do this? Uh, I have to reach down deep for an answer to this. And uh, how do I turn up? There we go. Let's see if we can get the actual one working. I have to enlist the friend, the, uh, the, um, the persuasive power of Jody Foster. Can you hear that? Power girl. Hi. You know this movie? No? Ages of data. Over sixty three thousand in all. And on the perimeter of each registration mark, but they don't line up. They do. If you think like a thing. An alien is gonna eat the credit more advanced. That means the efficiency functioning on multiple levels and in multiple dimensions. Yes, of course. <laughs> Tell me, tell me that wasn't the most thrilling thing you've ever seen on a movie screen. <laughs> I love that scene, and it helps Ben. It, it symbolizes what I what I want to do today. <laughs> so I ask myself, who would share their opinions and expertise about this stuff? The answer is obvious. The same people that do it now. Vegas. <laughs> no, actually, I mean Vegans and catalogers. This is what catalogers already do now. This, uh, this work is done now all over library land, but it's done in back office proprietary private systems. The work of managing vocabularies like this, you know, leave it to an organization like the NLM to get their stuff online and have it online for, for a decade or more like they have. Most of us don't. The people who have NACO and SACO training and all this kind of stuff, if you're doing this behind the scenes in your library, you're doing it in some very closed environment, and your record's going to get updated in a way that no one's going to see for a while. It's going to move through the machinations of our bibliographic utility infrastructure, such as it is. It's been working for a long time. But I think what we need to do is take these backroom systems and this particular activity and move it out to the web, or at least the output from them. And I think the way to do that is to do that with linked data. Use URIs as names for things. Use HTTP URIs. Give people useful things when they visit them. And when they're visiting them, also provide links to other useful stuff. Uh, if you start to do things like mixing in versioning or commenting, you're providing a lot more infrastructure for managing data over time. And hopefully, you can take a mess like this and turn it into something that starts to look a little more like that. Thank you. Catalogers aliens? <laughs> uh, no, just kidding. They, so, uh, <laughs> this is being recorded, right? <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, Gail, as you and several other people in this room know, this is really uh, this is really a story of uh, my life and romance. Uh, I'm married to a cataloger, so I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to bend our professional worlds yeah. back together. Um, no, I didn't call the name. No, no, no. Uh, but if men are from Mars, maybe women, or in this case, catalogers, are uh, from Vega. I don't know. I didn't mean to be gender specific. It's just a cataloger I know best happens to be a woman. I know a lot of female catalogers, etc. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm maybe a little late to the question of this, but it's kind of a fun. I, 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 I suspect probably a lot of you, especially in the catalogs, may be familiar with Sandra Berman and all the things that we've been trying to do over the years around getting um, our cataloging system reformed to not uh, to have terms that people can use, to have terms modernized. Um, I actually think this could be a real push in the right direction for those of us who are philosophically in line with him around um, the need for reform, as I think when you correctly categorize the backroom isolated systems taking place, you know, just one person after another, um, put them on the web, crowdsource them among the people who have knowledge of the area, and then throw them out to the library services, um, your, your problem around the need to maintain authority files uh, to make sure that uh, you know, anything that's been written since the 1860s on a similar topic has the same subject heading goes away because your taxonomies are updated in real time. Uh, I have two reactions to that. One is that um, obviously I, I, I agree on A level with you. Um, but I, I really, uh, I hope I emphasize this enough. I think the work they do is critical. And the work itself doesn't need to change a lot. Um, I don't know a lot of people with the specialized skills to do the kinds of difficult things they do. And they have tools that do work. Um, they just don't work in public. and. Uh, not everything needs to be made public, but at least the output of the work. I've, I've, I've long thought that what we're not doing is getting a lot of value, enough value, rather, out of that work um, across our, our field and into other fields. So I, I'm mainly arguing that, that, that the, the tooling, that you know, decades of debugged code that allows services like OCLC and others to manage and maintain data, that you know, some of that isn't going to change overnight. It's important. It's Bug, it's valuable. There's a reason people make money off this stuff. But what comes out of it, I think, needs to be made more public sooner and with better mechanisms for sharing data on the web. And I think we also have to pull in a way to bring in broader feedback uh, more closely to the process and to do that on the web near uh, the public display of this activity. So uh, I'm agreeing you, with you, sort of. I think we're sort. I think we're largely. I should say that I am not a cataloger. I think I work in a very similar area to you, which is the tech area. But I, I, I completely agree with what you're saying. That I think the there is a lot of value provided by the established practices. The issue is the tool, really, and and, and particularly public public. You know, getting information out to the public. I, I think fortunately, I think we're moving that way. Um, I just think there's further to go. Anybody else? We? Yeah. We. <laughs> All right, we got food over there.